Hi guys, we got an awesome, amazing, special guest. This guy is huge, John Clausen. I worked with him at DreamWorks. I was, it was a pleasure to actually share an office with him. And I learned so much just from picking his brain, uh, sitting in an office with him. And since then he's gone on and he's become a huge, huge children's book author. I like to tell people he's like the new Dr. Seuss. This guy is so fun to listen to, so fun to talk to, and he just has an understanding of art and the career of an artist more than most people seem to have. And this conversation was a blast. This is the first part of probably three or four parts that I'll release with John Clausen. So enjoy the show. So how have you been the last six years? <laughs> Not too bad, you know, same old, same old. So what? Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how you can say that about six years of any point in your life, yeah. probably. Yeah, there's got to be something in there that's either really bad or really good or probably both. But Yeah, well, um, I guess I guess I should uh, allow the anybody listening who doesn't know you to get a little recap on who you are and what you do. So if you could just um, talk about uh, maybe what you do for a living, some of the books you've done, and then maybe just where like you went to art college and what what your little history of your career is in a nutshell. Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, I went to, I'm from Canada originally. I live in Los Angeles now, but I'm from Toronto, uh, in the Toronto area uh, in Canada. And I went to college for animation. I went to Sheridan College up there for animation. And um, the, uh, the program up there uh, was made and kind of came into its own during the 90s when Disney was sort of uh, hitting their stride again with all of the animated features. The, the Little Mermaid really kicked it off again, I guess. And so a lot of the direct-to-video stuff started happening as well with Disney making like features that were just going on onto video. And so there's a lot more animation work. And Sheridan was training a lot of these animators. They needed trained animators. And so a lot of these schools sprung up to kind of train these people. And that's what I thought I wanted to do. And so I went to school and just took a three-year animation course uh, and all we basically learned was how to animate. We learned how to sort of do storyboarding and everything else, but the main focus was was straight animation. But I, I think I knew even when I was in school for it that I wasn't any good at animation and I didn't like it. Um, I liked drawing and I thought that was a job, but I didn't know the distinction between that and animating. And I found it out pretty quick. You do find it out pretty quickly. It turns out that yeah. you can draw uh, just fine and be a horrible animator and not find any interest in it at all and vice versa even which is even stranger I don't know how those people find out but you can be a not great drawer and be a fantastic animator because it's a whole different skill yeah. I don't know how you come into it then but uh, there are some kids like that I think um, but anyway I think I, I found out that I liked the design end of things better I wanted to do story at first but uh, after school ended uh, I got a story test from DreamWorks um, I did a couple other jobs in Vancouver and stuff just on design but I got in a story test from DreamWorks and and they liked it, and so they brought me down for an internship to do a storyboard, or at least for an internship program. And I did it for a little while, but figured out pretty quickly also that it, I'm not sure it was for me. I liked the, the amount of control that you had in story, but for my sensibilities and even my drawing level, I wasn't really able to kind of pull off what they were trying to get us to pull off. There was DreamWorks especially is big on action sequences and all these things, and that was this kind of stuff they were kind of training us to do. And anytime there was a fight or anything, I would sort of uh, I would flub it. I would sort of say, well, it happens off screen. There's a bunch of noises and, <laughs> and you, you know, the camera rests on like an empty part of the room where a bottle rolls into every now and then if it's like, they would just, I would cheat it. I, I enjoyed cheating it. And I liked sort of leaving that stuff out. But I think you can do that in certain venues, but not in feature animation and certainly not at DreamWorks. And that wasn't, I don't think it was a right or wrong answer to that kind of stuff. I just think it was a sensibility thing. And it was also just me not being very confident about how I would actually stage it and draw it. And so, a couple months into that, I'd gotten another offer to be a designer at Leica on Coraline. They were starting making features, and Coraline was going to be their first one. And they wanted me to come up and do uh, furniture and sort of sets and props and sort of just general production design work for it. And I loved that idea. I thought that was going to be way more up my alley. And so I went up there and worked on Coraline for about three years. And it was great. I think I really was suited to that much more than the story stuff. And I really learned a lot. Um, after that was finished, I came back down to DreamWorks with a design portfolio uh, saying, hey, I, I wanted to live in LA again, basically. I'd, I'd, met my, uh, I'd met my girlfriend 
who is now my wife, and I wanted to be back down there. She had met me, and she'd come up to Portland, but we both liked it in LA better. She's from down here. And I wasn't sure if Leica was going to keep going, and I was worried about a work visa because I'm from Canada. And so all those things together, I decided to try and apply back down here. And uh, I got the design gig at, at DreamWorks with the portfolio from Coraline stuff. And that's where you and I met, I think, was they yeah. put me on a couple different things. At first, I was on some Shrek movies and some development stuff for a couple, for, I think, about, about a, year, like a year, a year and a half. And then... Was your the, first job the Secrets of the Furious Five, or it was, it was on Shrek before Secrets of the Furious Five? I was on Shrek. I was on a bunch of stuff they had in development that, you know, they have, they have this kind of stable of people who just work on movies that they're thinking about. And oh, yeah. some of them don't really go anywhere. Some of them do. But they can be years sitting in those hallways. And it's actually a really fun part of the job because you get to kind of blue sky it but after a while you get kind of discouraged that nothing you're working on is ever going to get made yeah um and i think after a couple months on that i was better at that than i think i was they put me on shrek for a little while and again i was, a, I was supposed to be a designer on shrek and shrek for all of its weird aesthetics is a really hard movie to be a designer on it turned out <laughs> yeah. like it's a really tough show because the stuff that's the style is so crazy but it's also so like hyper real yeah and i was really used to sort of doing graphic stuff the stuff for Coraline was more like conceptual it was they were always going to build the sets and so the paintings I would be doing for them got pretty rough because we knew we could follow up in the shop the shop was just down the hall and I could go down to the shop and give them this kind of rough sketch and they would know what I was talking about but the stuff for Shrek was like this really rendered like it has to look like a film still uh with all the you know the reflective light and all this kind of stuff happening and I was I was in over my head and I think they knew it and but they they had also seen my graphic stuff, and I think one day at lunch, Ramon and Tang, who were the production designer and the art director on Kung Fu Panda, kind of came up to my table or something. They had a we had a phone call or something. I can't remember what it was, but they were like, "Hey, we heard you're on Shrek. Uh, we want to show you what you're working on. What we're working on." And they showed me the dream sequence from Kung Fu Panda, the first one. At least they were they were kind of halfway through it. And I had I had never seen anything like this. I was like, "What the yeah. hell is this? You guys are making this here?" And they said, "Yeah, yeah, we are." And I was like, "Well, why are you showing me this? This is like torture. I want to do this stuff. Are you, you going to bring me on or what?" And I didn't even know if I could cut it with these guys. Like these were the best guys, and it's exactly what I yeah. wanted to do. But it doesn't mean you can. And um, but they're like, "No, yeah, come on on and, and sort of we'll we think we can use you on the crew for the movie going forward." But it's just that this stuff. Let's see what let's let's see what we can put together. And I think they were just starting on the Furious Five stuff that we met on, which was okay. um, sort of an extension of that dream sequence into a you know a bunch of shorts that were going to look the same way. It was all two D animated with James Baxter heading up the animation and the, and the compositing and stuff, and then us working on um, backgrounds and 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 well, you you were you were a compositor at that point on this yeah, stuff. Yeah, I started already out had... compositing. Yeah, and then it went into design later. Yeah, yeah, and so that was that was a leading up to our meeting was. That was kind of the history of it. I've yeah. been bounced around a little bit. Yeah. Now, I remember seeing some storyboards you did for DreamWorks. <laughs> and it was like, I remember <laughs> like there's like penguins just standing yeah. there with blank expressions. And then, <laughs> and then there's something else. That one of them moves their head. It was, it's exactly like out of your books, but it just totally, it was like. <laughs> I think that's what it was. I think there was something subversive. I didn't think it was subversive. And I've never felt subversive. But when I got a hold of this stuff, DreamWorks would give you scripts. To, yeah. to try and board. It was scripts that they weren't going to make. It was stuff that they'd played with but decided against making. But you were in training. And so they said, well, here's a script we're not going to make, but let's see what you do with the sequence. So they give you a script and you board a sequence. And I hated the script they gave me. I remember not liking it at all. It was crass and it was all the things, you know, DreamWorks <laughs> has gotten a lot better at this, but certainly at the time they were still doing jokes I wasn't really interested in, all this kind of stuff. Yeah. And so I was mad. I think I was I was feeling snobby too. I was feeling snobby the way you feel when you're like 24 years old and you're 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 out of your element and you're scared and so you're just like I'm just mad at everybody. And so instead of sort of giving them what they would have wanted, which is like a highly rendered really overacted board, I gave them like popsicle sticks with eyes basically. <laughs> yeah. And I thought I don't think that it was me being a punk like a jerk. I liked the job, but I didn't feel like I wanted out necessarily, but I wanted to try and see, I was more interested, I guess, in the dry aspect of boarding and how dry it could look over top of this crazy material. Okay. And, and it just also seemed like the boards I was seeing, it was mostly a staging job. Like it wasn't, you weren't acting, I didn't think. You were, you were giving opportunities for acting for the animators who were the real actors, but you were basically setting up these shots so that the thing had room for them to do their thing. And so all my boards just looked like they were just cardboard cutouts of the same character being moved around, which is essentially what they were. We were drawing with them with Sharpies and stuff. Like we weren't uh, using Photoshop yet for those boards. We were pinning them and drawing them on real paper. But it was also like 
I loved how much you could get out of so little with these boards. It was so much fun. I'd never done that before. And all of a sudden, just by moving someone a quarter inch over from the next board, that meant that they shuffled over a little bit. And that was a real <laughs> emotional thought. And I, I was so excited by how minimal you could be and still get like, yeah. like, like distance out of it. But DreamWorks did not see it that way. They were just like, no, what the hell is he doing? He yeah. has to make him do something. I was like, he did something. He did a yeah. lot right there. And that day, <laughs> it was yeah. just a totally opposite thing. And so when we were working on design stuff at DreamWorks, I got um, book illustration work just in the evenings to do my own. And I hadn't boarded in a long time, and I hadn't really been doing much narrative work, just design with you and, and you know, the movies and, and everything else. But as soon as the book stuff came along, all that old sort of stuff came back where I was like, oh, wait a minute, picture books, that's what this is for. It's for skipping mm -hmm. the action and landing at the moment after or starting the moment before. And it's meant, because you can't show action in a picture book. It's not a moving medium. It's a still medium. And so you have to skip action. That's, that's what it's best at. And all of a sudden, it was just like, okay, now I know the sort of a process of elimination. Like, this is what I like to do. This is how I like to tell stories. And maybe I can make a go of it because this medium kind of meets me where I'd like to be yeah. met. And so that, that must have been when, like, right before we started sharing an office, because you were kind of already into that, like, picture books, like, mentality. It's like you were obsessing over it at that time already yeah I and think I was, so. that's I think when I was obsessing over my thing <laughs> yeah yeah we both kind of met in this job where it was a great job I think that a lot yeah. of people like you know what I mean like everyone I talked to was just like wow that's a great gig and I agreed it was a great yeah. gig but we both met in this place where we were just like we were sort of having affairs with other <laughs> mediums and sort of secretly talking about it in this office and, and just really falling in love deeply with this other yeah. <laughs> thing yeah. while we were sitting in this beautiful campus working on these great films and it, I don't I don't lament my time there at all. I learned yeah. a lot. Those guys were, were the best in the business. I think they still are. The design work on, on the Panda movies is some of the best I've ever seen in animation. It's amazing. Yeah. And those guys taught us so much. But I, I'm glad it went the way it did. I, I think you, it sounds like you are as well. When, when you came to me and said, you know what, I don't think I'm going to renew my contract, I was like secretly like, John, you're doing what I want to do. Darn it. <laughs> like, ah. I was like angry, but also because I felt like, uh, I was learning a lot from you. Like the, the, the simplicity in your design was so um, fun to talk to you about and see how you were doing it. And um, so you leaving was such a huge like inspiration for me <laughs> because I was like, someone did it. They actually uh, got out of this job that is great. And it's kind of the top of the animation industry job, I guess. But you're walking away from it and you're going somewhere else and you're being successful at it. And it well, was it should so be inspiring. said too. Like I think it's important to have some context with it too, because I'm not, I'm not prone to burning down the house and leaving these things in shards. <laughs> I've quit a lot of jobs, but I never quit. Yeah. I don't think I've ever quit a job where I didn't close the door as gently as Canadianly possible. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> and uh, and also the thing with the DreamWorks thing was that I, um, I remember getting a book agent while I had, still had the DreamWorks gig, and I had just signed on for like two and a half years. I wouldn't give them three for whatever reason. I just couldn't bear it. And they asked for three and I was like two and a half, even though that's like no difference at all. Um, I just couldn't sign away three years. And I think that's, that'll show right away where your head is at, even though you don't want to think so. But it's, but they, uh, but once it was, an, I got a book agent and I said, I have two and a half years left in this contract. How much work can we scare up? Like, can I hit the ground running um, when this contract is up so that maybe we can, I don't have to sign up again. And if that was like, if that's not necessarily quitting, that's just not asking for a new contract. So all those things together is like, I felt like it was like the safest way to sort of, you know, you can say, look, back, look on it now and be like, yeah, I left this studio gig and all this stuff. But I really, I think I left like five door stops between the door and the door yeah. jam because like I didn't, I was yeah. like, this is, this probably isn't going to work and I'm going to have to come back here. I'll do two or three books. You know, I'll get my, I'll get this out of the way and get my sort of, you know, get this little phase out and done with and then I have to come back and and, and you know it wasn't and a it wasn't with, a yeah. horrible thought yeah. it was just like this will this will do for a few years I had no idea if it was going to work or not and so yeah. you know it, 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 you can yeah you can say that it was this thing where we left but um, <laughs> yeah well, I really I was, I'm in the same boat too like yeah. I, I signed a, a year and a half freelance contract with them just so I could keep that door open <laughs> even though I left <laughs> 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 or I, I didn't renew my contract, and then I signed another one saying, "Yeah, I'll still take freelance, but then I, I've I, I've been too busy to take it." So, um, 
And I think it's about ending now, actually. Oh, really? So my strings are finally kind of a little bit more cut, but... But yeah, I try to do it as politely as possible. I'm still well. You're just so you're just like there's no knowing, right? Yeah. Even if like there's just so many variables, there's so many things you can. I mean, if anything, this like working in any length of time in any one of these areas of this business can show you that just because the work is good, or even if you think it's good, or and even other people say it's good, that doesn't mean it's going to make it. That doesn't mean. Yeah, it's gonna it's gonna true. be this thing. There's so many other elements, and so you can walk out thinking I've got all these great ideas, or I've got so much love for this medium that I'm going into, or I've got, you know, all this energy to put into discovering what it's going to be like. None of those things necessarily guarantee you this stuff, and so you you have to close all these things so gently. And also, I wasn't angry at anybody over there. You know, you want to be yeah. nice to them and yeah. and and thank them for their support and their time and everything else. And so you don't want to, and you're just scared, of this, right? You just don't yeah. know if you can. If, if it's going to work and, and if you really are like going to go back in there and say, oh, well, you, you left it, you know, and here was this job that for 20 yeah. years you thought you wanted and you said goodbye to because of this weird flirtation you had with books <laughs> for a few years, but it turned out the other way, at least so far. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, um, can you talk a little bit about getting an agent? Because I have a lot of people ask me and I, I don't have an agent and I've never pursued an agent, um, but you, yeah. you had a great... Uh, I had a great conversation with you about how you got your agent, and I was just wondering if you could tell people about it. Well, I don't think it's really strange because people, I'm not sure, I've yet to meet anybody who gets an agent in a straightforward, regular way. Like, it always seems to be through a side door somewhere. It's really rare that it just happens the way that you think it ought to happen. Um, When I first got into books, I was approached by publishers, not by agents, um, because they had art directors and things that were trawling around looking at blogs and stuff. I think that's what a lot of art directors do when they look for new talent and stuff is they just sort of go around and see what's going on on the internet, especially back then when people kept blogs more often and stuff and they didn't have tumblers or something like that. But um, I'd gotten an email from a publisher asking if I wanted to illustrate a book and um, and it was great. It was, a, it, was a, it was an art director who'd been kind of following my stuff for a while and we talked a little bit about doing books for a bit. Um, and we just never sort of found the right time or I'd pitched her some stuff and, and it was based on my short film and it didn't really work. Um, but we finally, like she kind of kept track of me and it was really nice. It was about as nice as a thing as you can hope to happen to you. Is it's like this art director kind of keeps you in mind for these books. Mm-hmm. And so she finally did uh, kind of find something that we could do. But I was worried because I didn't know anything about contracts with books. Um, and I'd mm-hmm. heard that, you know, the advantage with books was that you can keep everything you draw. With animation, we're just used to signing everything away, right? And you're just working for your time. But with books, it's supposed to be that you keep your drawings and they just get the right to publish them in that hmm. format. Mm-hmm. And so, um, and also I just didn't know about book advances. I didn't know what was right, what the percentage of residuals was supposed to be, any of that stuff. And so um, the only person I knew who was doing books was a friend of mine uh, at another studio. And I asked him if he had an agent. And he said, yeah, I did. And he, he gave me the guy's number and I called him and he was okay. He was, I think there are different kinds of agents with different models of how they go about agenting. And this guy's model was that he was mainly a lawyer and he was going to vet any contract that I brought along, but he wasn't going to find me work. Mm -hmm. Um, And he said like, you bring me contracts and I'll make sure you don't get screwed, but I'm not going to go out there pounding the pavement for you. And at that time, that's what, that was all I needed anyway, because I needed, I had this contract in hand. It didn't sound ideal because I knew I already wanted someone to kind of go out there and, and help build a, like a job for me. But in the meantime, I, I just didn't have any other options. And so um, we went together on this book. Um, but I was talking to another editor who had written me about doing books who I was pitching stuff to and talking to her about this agent and saying, I was having some problems with him. We, we, weren't, we, we were trying to figure out something and I didn't like how it was going. And she's like, oh, no, you need a different agent. You need a guy who's going to, I know a good agent. I'll set you up with him. And so... Um, she put me in touch with this with, with the guy I have now, is Steve Malk over at Writer's House. And it was like we had a phone call, and it was just sort of this great kind of falling in love phone call where it was just like we understood each other. We understood what we each liked about books and what we wanted to do in them. And he's just a real purist about picture books. He didn't want anybody, and still he doesn't want anybody who's just going to do it in a supplemental way. He wants someone who's all in. Yeah. And he, like, there's a lot of illustrators, I think, who, especially now, more and more view picture books as this way to sort of make money while you do what it is you really want to do. Um, and it's, I mean, there are some good, there's some good books that come out of a process like that, but I think there are more good books that come out of the process where people are like, um, this is what I, 
you know what I mean? Like just, yeah. I, I think there's, there's some gray area and I certainly understand the gray area because of course you have to do a lot of different kinds of work to, to make a go of anything on the illustration job. But um, Steve was mostly interested in whether I wanted to pursue this as, as a career or not. And I really was. I was, and he, I think he could tell that I was being genuine about it. And mostly it was just him sort of explaining too that books are a whole different landscape full of its own politics and its own people and its own traditions, a very traditional, still a very traditional sort of area of work. And so having someone to kind of say like, are editors supposed to do this? Am I supposed, can I ask this of an editor? Can I ask this of an art director? Can I make demands this way or can should I let this argument go? That kind of thing where you're not really sure um, how things are done in books. I can call him and, I, and he explained this to me. He was like, look, just call me about anything you want and we, we can sort of make a plan about you know, what kind of illustrator you want to be. Do you want to be a hard-nosed guy who argues everything and, and takes high advances? Because they are those guys and they're very successful and if that's the kind of person that, or that's the kind of job that attracts you, you can do that. Or you can be someone on the other side of the spectrum who takes low advances and doesn't argue. Like, all these things, these, you can put together sort of your, your business model, at, for lack of a better term, and sort of be this, like, act how you want to act and sort of make a plan for what that's going to mean for the next few years. And it was just so interesting having someone talk to me about that and saying, like, look, this is a, this is a long game. Um, mm -hmm. At first, it's not going to be hugely profitable, but, um, and it might never be. We have to figure that out. But this is, these are your options and what appeals to you. It's almost like a stockbroker when you don't know anything about money going in and, and they're like, if you don't know anything about investing, they'll ask you very simple questions and just try and break it down, right? To kind of mm -hmm. say, well, are you low risk or high risk? Does this appeal to you? Does that appeal to you? And you don't even know how those answers are applying to what it is they're figuring out. But they come to you at the end with a picture of what they think you are like as an investor. And that's kind of the same thing as what Steve did. He's like, I think this is the kind of illustrator you are. Yeah. Um, and it was really helpful because all of that stuff is beside the point of illustrating. It doesn't mean that you can be a great illustrator and horrible at that whole other side of it and wreck it. Um, it really helps to have someone explain and help you mm. be a person in the world as not just an illustrator. Yeah, it's great. Yeah. And you were saying before when I talked to you about it that um, and I guess you kind of mentioned this, but you basically were uh, picked up kind of by a, a publisher and then you went to an agent and said, hey, can you sign on because this publisher wants to publish me, right? Instead yeah. of the other way, which is find the agent who will then find the publisher. And I think it can go, yeah, it can go, I mean, yeah, it does sound like a pretty sweet way to kind of go about it because you go in there with contract <laughs> in hand. And again, like I, I agree. I, the, the art director who, who brought me on, Lucy Cummins, who we still work together on some stuff every now and then. Yeah. Um, she really, like, I, I don't think it would have happened without her. None of it, none of it. And so you can't really say it wouldn't have happened without Steve either. But you, you acknowledge pretty quickly, um, if you're being honest about it, that it really is a group effort, and you're not gonna, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like you need that. You need those footholds and those people helping you up. Um, yeah. And I don't know how to explain how that happens or how to, how to make that start because I right. didn't start it myself. It yeah. was something like I kept putting work out there and I think that my work was sort of lending itself more and more to book work because I was getting more and more interested in text and sort of simpler mm -hmm. illustrations. And so I think when the, when the art director saw it, she was like, no, I can use this. Mm -hmm. um, so that helps them. But you can't say that, you know, well, this is what I did. And then I got into books. Like yeah. people stopped yeah. you along the way and been like, no, I can help you up to this next step. And you, know, yeah, you would yeah. have no idea how to do it on there. It's like everyone at DreamWorks. It's like you talk to everyone there and like, how'd you get into DreamWorks? And everyone had a completely <laughs> different path. Yeah. But it, so I, I think you're right, though. I think that like the answer seems to be, and it's sort of a naive sounding one, is that like you got to do the work that interests you. And those that work will find the people whose job it is to kind of plug that in. Do you know what I mean? Like yeah, it's really hard totally. to know where it's going to fit. But if you yeah. stick to what it is that's, that's interesting you and yeah. kind of hone that down, it has homes more often like now than any other time where things are getting so specialized and, and it's mm. finding really special audiences is that that actually rewards that process of, of kind of make, keeping yourself interested and sort of figuring out what it is that really turns you on about the work. Yeah. Someone else will come to you. Even inside the studio I found that was the, like that was what happened. Those yeah, Kung Panda guys, true. they Very saw my, my book and they were like, we have a show for you over here that really fits your strengths. Yeah. And I was on a show that didn't. I didn't know that happened. No one told you in school that, no one told me in school that studios were going to help you with that. I thought that you had to do the work to kind of, and you do have to do the work to catch up to the show and to sort of figure out how you're going to adapt to those things. But it also happens that really good people are watching you very closely and thinking, all right, well, he's good at this. Yeah. He's bad at that. Yeah. But if he's good at this, we can use him over there. And they don't want to fire you. They don't want to, you know what I mean? They want to, if, you, if you're good at some things, they want to plug you into that. And it's good yeah. business to do that. Yeah, I think that people sense. don't know that as much. It's, um, it's, 
that was huge for me learning that they did that. Yeah. It was great. Yeah. I always tell people, you do a personal project, finish it, and then the doors will open for your career, you know? And you just have it. My life is all personal projects that I finish. And then it just like you and said, you it turns of, yeah. people onto what styles I'm good at and what I'm, what I love doing. Yeah. And like, you're a horrible person to, to judge your own style and your own stuff, right? Like you, you kind of just yeah, follow your nose. I'm not saying you as are, far as like the Royal you <laughs> is like, you like just people themselves are bad at stepping outside their own stuff and being like, Oh yeah, this is what I'm good at. You yeah. don't know. As you far, have to kind of, especially as a career, you know, like I'm going to go into this career and this will satisfy my, my desires with my artistic, <laughs> you know, it's yeah. like you get into it and you're all like, this isn't what I thought it was. And then you try this little part. No, that's not what I thought it was. And try this part. And that, that seems like people's careers in general, you know. But if you just focus on a personal thing, what do you love doing when you wake up in the morning? What do you obsess over? Then it kind of, you know, people come to you. Just like what you were saying, people come to you and find that and want to use it in, in the job. I think that that process, too, of sort of taking your own temperature inside a project is such a useful tool. Like, it's, it's something you can get better and worse at, I think. Um, the uh you know what i mean because you could be on a like say the kung fu panda guys came up to me and they were like this is the show we want you on and i love the look of it and everything else there are still sections inside that movie even though the movie looks great generally they can put you in a place inside that movie that you might not be great at or even mm, like small yeah. ways of doing the jobs like that process of sort of taking your own temperature and being like oh this part really i'm into but this part i'm not yeah um sort of figuring like that's you can be being a snob about it and being picky and resistant, but there's also something in there that's really talking to you and saying like, this is the part that you are good at. Like you are interested in it and you will think about it more. So you're going to get better at it. Yeah, and exactly. That's a whole, I'm not sure people go into jobs with that because they can be, every one of them can be sort of this learning experience where you come out of it being like, all right, well now I know more about myself because I didn't like that whole last part. Yeah. What, what, why didn't I like that last part? And does that mean that I should focus on something else or should I focus on, just the first section and even when you're roughing something out the next time you can remember that you hated following up on certain things that you did in the early project mm -hmm. and be like well i want to avoid that this time and so in the rough for this one i'm going to suggest that we do this and that way i won't have to like all those things um keeping track of your like what you're feeling like inside even inside a drawing when you're doing like just one drawing you're like oh i can't wait to get to this part of the drawing that's information that's really yeah. useful information yeah. And you can break it down smaller and smaller until you're just keeping track of like seconds inside a drawing and being like, well, I can't wait to get to this or this curve yeah. is really into like all those things. It's you can't really quantify it. And you're a horrible person to kind of if you had to write an essay on it, you couldn't. But it's real stuff. And it's really yeah. telling you things about your own work and where you should go and what you should try yeah. to focus on. That reminds me of something you said that has stuck with me when we we're when I was in the office with you. And I always tell people about being in the office with you, by the way. <laughs> it was a great, I loved it. So, oh, um, no. <laughs> yes, it was good. Um, you, you, you were talking like with one of your books, I don't know if it was the dark where you're like, uh, trying to like figure out what to do with a page. And you're like, this page isn't interesting. So I just don't want to do it. I, I, this part is interesting in this part. And so I should just focus on those parts almost it, it was something to that effect and so when i'm doing my comics now there's a lot of times in the scripts where i'm like this is kind of i just don't really care about this scene and so i figure out a way to either eliminate it and add it to the scenes that i'm interested in or or i do it in like prose version <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah and it's really been helpful because it keeps me excited about every page that I'm working on. And if it's not yeah. exciting, then I know there's a problem and I probably shouldn't be doing that page then. Well, the other problem is I think not, it's not a problem, but it's, it's definitely a real thing is that I think an audience can tell when a person's lost interest in the drawing too. Mm -hmm. Like you could, you could solve the thing you're not interested in, sort of try and find the most interesting way to get this thing you're not interested in and sort of, you know, yeah. just beat it to death until it's done. But I think an audience can inherently, even little kids, it turns out, because that's my audience now, I think they kind of, actually, they're, they're the most sensitive to that. You can have an ugly looking book that has a, like, that adults do not like. But if the person was enthusiastic when they made it, mm -hmm. kids almost only care about that. Almost all the books I see that do really, really well have that in common. They might not all look great. They might, there's, there's some really mysteriously horrible books that kids are just so into. But you can always kind of tell that the person who made it totally believed in it and was mm -hmm. really turned on when they made it. And, like, it was just a 
it was just pushing all their buttons, the person mm -hmm. who made it. And mm -hmm. it's, it's like a business decision to do that too. But it's, I remember doing an ad at DreamWorks when I was, I think I was sharing an office with you. We did a spot for some royal, it was a freelance job, but I was thinking about it a lot at work. And it was this thing where they'd given me a brief, it was for a bank. And it was for a bank that they were doing like some sort of clean water initiative. So they wanted to do an ad kind of promoting that and saying that they were doing it. And so the first half of the commercial was all like really nice natural forest scenes and icebergs and things. And it was great. It was really fun. And it was exactly what I like to draw. But mm -hmm. the second half of the brief was like, and then we transition into how we're applying it as a bank. And we want illustrations of like people at like a conference, all at <laughs> conference tables. And then that goes into like people looking at charts and things. And I was like, I was so turned on by the first part that I was like, oh, I'll get to that. I'm sure it'll be fine. And then I got to it and I was like, there is no interesting way I can draw this. There is no way to, in, to, to draw an interesting conference room. Like, I can't do it. <laughs> yeah. And so I remember just thinking, like, admitting that to myself and to the director, saying, like, look, maybe someone else can draw this really well, but I would suggest that we skip this whole conference center part and just show like a deer drinking from the water and the ripples from the water can be i said something dumb like that where it was like the ripples can represent the cause and effect that you're trying to look at with this and he was like cause and effect yeah and i think maybe he understood that i was bullshitting it too but he knew he could sell that to the agency who could sell it to the bank and so it was going to be okay and that's what we did and so it was like we you kind of figured out like maybe there isn't a way to solve this and i know i can draw the other thing and it's going to look better anyway like you do that to your own stuff too. You were like, well, I yeah. can't, that's never, that might be a really interesting story point, but I can't find an opportunity in there. Like I can't find yeah. a way into that problem. And the more you sort of figure out that you can do that and that it's, it actually makes, and no one knew, you know, the people watching the commercial will never know that there was a potential conference center <laughs> that, that yeah. got left on the cutting room floor. They just see a very cohesive sort of deer head coming out of the, <laughs> the thing. Yeah. But that was a big lesson when I finally, when, like, when they took that note and they were like, yeah, we'll do that. That sounds like a great substitute because you mm. explain like, look, I, you have hired me and I can't make an interesting conference room drawing. So what do we do? And they can fire you and you lose that job, but then you didn't have to draw a conference center or they take your note. And yeah. one, like either way, you don't end up with a portfolio of stuff that you're not happy with. See, that's what's so interesting, I think, about your personality that's always been attractive to me is you don't you don't try to become something you're not and so many artists they they manipulate their styles to kind of to be able to to to, to be whatever it is that they're called to do and so they may become more diversified in their skill set and their styles but they it doesn't seem like they're very satisfied with their careers because they're just kind of like doing whatever everyone else wants them to. And it seems like you've always had this kind of mentality of like, I, that's cool, you guys, but I don't draw that. So I don't know how you're going to get that out of me. <laughs> and it's, <laughs> Well, that's the thing is it's not even necessarily like, I think the strength in it is sort of acknowledging your weaknesses sort yeah, of, right? It's that, yeah. like, it's not necessarily that I'm being stubborn or something. I know I physically can't do it. Like they're not going to get a good drawing yeah, and but, it's not even going to be but an okay if you real, so you're If you went and took some like conference room drawing lessons, I mean, <laughs> you could, it's just, it wouldn't look cool to you you know what i'm saying it's not good work i guess yeah, yeah i guess that's yeah. the thing and then you're sort of telling them that i don't know um, i remember i remember a teacher in school telling us because we we're putting together portfolios and stuff and the impulse when you're in school putting together a portfolio is to get as big a portfolio as you can get right like as many yeah. pages you did all this work you spent three four years drawing like crazy let's put it all in there let's just really wow them with how much there is yeah and we had one teacher who was really great and he was like if you don't like it if you're not really into it, don't put it in there. They're never going to know what you don't put in. Mm -hmm. um, and that was such an interesting lesson. And it's an, like a lesson for all this kind of stuff, right? Is that like only show the best stuff, like only show the stuff that you're really into. Yeah. And it will actually like, it will help them sort of see your best stuff. But it actually helps you when you're left with only the stuff that you like. Because we were all putting together websites and stuff too. We yeah. wouldn't, we would, everyone was putting everything they ever made on a website in those years. And so, but it was this huge glut. It was like just a massive amount of work. And you were like, if you did a drawing, I better scan it. I better put it <laughs> online. That's what we got to do. Yeah. But then he was saying, don't do that. Just put the stuff you really like. And then when you're going to someone else's website, you're never going to see stuff like you're only going to see their great work. And you're going to think that's what they do because it is what they do. Yeah. It's not yeah, dishonest, totally. Totally. but it just encourages you. And then you're left yourself looking at a book or at a website of your own saying like, huh, this is pointing in a certain direction. Like, Look at what I've, look at what I've sort of pared it down to. 
it really does speak to some sort of direction. And that's harder to find when you're just looking at everything you've ever done and all the mistakes and dead ends you've hit. If yeah. you just looked at the stuff that you think works, there is there's an arrow it makes pointing in a certain direction, I think. I hope you guys enjoyed that. There's going to be two or three more parts to this. I have John's books in the show notes. So if you could please support John by going and buying his books. Um, if you buy them from my links, I'll get a little commission too. But just you can go to a store anywhere and find John's books. And they are so good. They're so amazing. And um, I just love the guy and I really uh, admire what he's done with his art career and the decisions he's made. So uh, subscribe if you haven't. We will be back with more of John Clausen in a little bit.